And so we're told if he leaves, engage him. So the, the VI missions had um, either, you know, capture, um, shoot who's ever in there, like the driver or something to keep the, the HVT alive or um, terminate everybody. You know, this is a kill mission. Well, this was definitely a kill mission because this was a bad guy. Everyone who was with him was a bad guy. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today, we hear the combat story of a longtime Night Stalker from the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, or SOAR, Steve Lapping. Steve participated in many high-profile operations that many of us have heard of, like the Jessica Lynch rescue and the Saddam Hussein capture, and many operations we have not heard of, like Objectives Reindeer and Leadville, which we'll hear about on this episode. This was a special interview for me, as you can imagine, giving Steve's story background as an elite pilot, spending over two decades in 160th and another 10 years in Army aviation. We also touch on some of the heartbreak that comes with years in the cockpit with accidents, shoot downs, and crashes, including the feeling in SOAR following Operation Gothic Serpent, aka Black Hawk Down. Steve is one of the most humble individuals you're going to encounter. In fact, I had to dig in to figure out that Steve was a CW5, which is an incredibly difficult rank to achieve in the aviation community, and to learn about his awards and decorations in combat. I hope you enjoy this combat story from inside one of the most lethal cockpits from such a humble warrior as much as I did. Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you for taking the time to share your story with us. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So one of the things you just mentioned before we hit record was the shirt that you have on. I mistook it for a typical Hawaiian shirt. And I'm, for those who can't see it, it is Hawaiian style, but instead of flowers or something on it, it's got, are those AHs or are they MHs? I can't yeah, see. Yeah, AH6s. AH6s, which we're going to talk about a lot. How often do you get to wear this? Because I'm assuming if your wife is anything like mine, not very often. Well, I can wear it as many times as I want to around the house. You know, we <laughs> go anywhere, then uh, you're not wearing that, are you? So I, I took the liberty to go ahead and wear it today, you know, as, as one of the three or four times I wear it during the year. Awesome. But still very proud of it. Absolutely. And and actually, for those who can't see, the backdrop is also really cool. Guide on back there. Some some really impressive uh, artwork on the wall behind you representing a whole lot of uh, service that we'll get to. Uh, the other thing, as I was getting ready for this, Steve, that I was really impressed by, I had to ask this as we were getting ready to hit record. Um, you're a CW5, and I think a lot of people might make a bigger deal of that, and you haven't. And you just don't run into many W5s. So as you look back on this uh, very long and, and storied career, do you end up um, do you end up getting asked a lot about, hey, did you end up as a four or a five? Does that end up being a conversation piece for you? It, it actually does. Yeah. You know, for, for those that are familiar with the warrant officer rank, um, it, you know, there just aren't a lot of CW5s. And so when you talk about in the service and then in the Army and then how the Army's broken up into uh, technical branches and aviation. And so being in the aviation branch, you know, more so than, than any other branch of the, uh, of any of the services. So you tend to see a little bit more, um, and then going into the one sixtieth, you know, where it was very unique because the CW fives were allowed to remain in the company. And so, you know, I've got a picture, uh, of five CW fives, and so there was usually four pilots deployed at any one time, and we had five deployed, and three of them were in a cockpit, and I think we had a W-2 with us. So, you know, and this is just a standard rotation, three CW-5s, a W-2, and then uh, the maintenance guy was a CW-5, and then somebody who was on staff, uh, li liaison was a W-5, you know, and so... You know, it, it was just like being uh, a, just another rank, really. 
you know, but then when I left the units and I went to uh big army, so to speak, you know, I was one of two guys in the entire brigade that was a CW five. And so then, you know, you became a little bit more of a, a unicorn uh, in that situation. Got it. Yeah. Very interesting. Do you remember by any chance the first time you flew with the W five when you were a junior warrant? You know, the first time, um, when I went to my first unit, it was a third armored cavalry regiment in Fort bliss. And we had W fours then. So the W five rank hadn't come out and I was pretty darn impressed, you know, with these CW fours, all Vietnam vets. And, uh, and then I remember master MW four came out and a gentleman in the, the one sixtieth was one of the first ones to make that rank. And so I flew with them, but, you know, I'd known those guys for, you know, five, six years already. So it wasn't a big deal at that time. But uh, I think that the, the person who kind of uh, is most memorable to me in that kind of rank thing was I was out at NTC and the National Guard came out to augment us with two attack battalion, or excuse me, two attack companies. And they, you know, uh, it, it was a uh, it was a loach, so it was the first time I'd really you know been in close to uh, close proximity to a loach, and then uh, I'm standing there and they said, "Are you a pilot?" I said, "Well, yeah, I'm not a very good one, you know." And oh, you wanna go flying in a loach? I'm like, "Hell yeah, I do!" <laughs> so I went out with this you know even crustier CW4 National Guard loach pilot out of the uh, Tennessee Guard, and man, we just had a blast, you know. So it, it was kind of a that was my my rank guy there just because he was flying a loach that's cool that's really cool and we'll get into a lot of the aircraft here in a bit i'm super excited to do this if you can take us back to when you were growing up one of the things that uh, you had mentioned as we were preparing for this has to do with um jumping into some cold water at a young age i was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that well yeah i think one of the questions was you know is what prepared me at a, a young age or or what was a you know, a parallel um, to my youth that, you know, continued into the army. And so I thought kind of long and hard and, and I was good buddies with uh, three or four kids in the neighborhood, all the same age, same grade. And we decided it'd be a good idea to go up to the lake up the street. And it was still, you know, probably September. So it was still a little cold. We still had some ice on the lake and it was a supply lake. And so it was four of us at the time and we decided to uh, go up on the cove in the lake where that we knew there'd be some ice. And so now we're playing around on the ice as shoot, I guess we were 13, 14 years old, not, I know not old enough to drive. And so we jump on the ice and, you know, now we want to make an iceberg and be, you know, captain of the iceberg, I guess. And so we get some long branches and, you know, after a while, we were able to break this big chunk of ice away from the, uh, the bank. And so now all four of us are on the ice, you know, and it's not really moving too far. And the cove is, is actually pretty big. And it's actually a pretty good distance from one side of the cove to the other, even at the, you know, the, the innermost part of the inlet. And so, you know, 10, 15 minutes go by. The ice is starting to, you know, move towards the center a little bit more. Um, it's starting to get uh, smaller, you know, because we're jumping on it and it's starting to sink and maybe melt a little bit. Well, we decided this is a good time for us to get off the ice, you know, good idea guys here. So we jump off the ice and as our buddy who's not paying attention is still on with his back to us, one of the guys takes a big pole and, you know, gives that little extra shove to the ice, which now takes him out of distance from being able to jump to the shore. So, oh, way to go, jackass, you know, and we're all laughing. Um, so now we just think, well, the iceberg is going to go to the other side of the cove and he'll jump off there. Well, long story, probably longer. It doesn't. It gets in the center of the cove and now it starts moving towards the lake and it starts melting. And so, you know, this is ours and the water is cold. It is freezing. And so you know, now we're getting a little concerned. It was fun for a while. Now we're concerned. And so I just said, well, we got to do something about it. So I weighed into my chest, you know, about up to my, my heart. And I'm like, dude, 
I'm, you know, I'm maybe halfway. I said, go ahead and jump in. I'll get you, you know, we'll go to shore. Come on. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just something that, that, you know, I felt needed to be done. And the other guys were like, yeah, I'm not going in that cold water. You gotta be crazy. And he, he didn't jump in. And so the other two, because, you know, they weren't freezing cold, they run up the street, they flag down a car, which happens to be my mom. She calls the fire department, fire department comes down, they put a boat in and they get him. you know, and, and he's up to, you know, two feet of water past his knees. And so anyway, so they haul us all out of there. Uh, he and I both have uh, hypothermia, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of frostbite and, and a very tragic story was averted, thank God, you know, and, and everybody walked away. But, you know, just what I thought you know, uh, and the motto of the, the night stalkers is, you know, night stalkers don't quit. And, you know, I, I was just ready to, uh, to, to help them out and do whatever it, it takes, you know, to, to save my friend. Yeah. Jeez. It, I can't imagine what was your mom like, Oh, you, I got to have a talk with you <laughs> later on. <laughs> that day. Yeah. Yeah. That, that anything the police said to me, you know, or the firemen, you know, cause they, they'd been through that whole bunch of times. And, you know, my mom was, uh, you know, very, um, protective. And so she was concerned and then she was pissed and then, you know, happy yeah. go through all those emotions at once. Right. Yeah. Um, so you, you mentioned obviously the night stalkers is a huge part of your career at the time when you join is there this idea of I'm going to go aviation, not even night stalkers, but like, I just want to go in and fly. Is that part of your childhood somehow? So, uh, you know, uh, and I hear others tell their story and I'm probably the polar opposite. Uh, I mean, no, you know, when I was uh, growing up, I always had a fascination with the military. You know, I played with Revolutionary Army men. I played with Civil War Army men. I played with, you know, World War II. And I always had a tank nearby, you know, setting up some type of battlefield scenario. So I always was very fascinated with the military. I knew I wanted to go in. Uh, Both my mom and dad served in the the Navy. Um, My grandfather served in the Pacific during World War II. And so, you know, there was some family, you know, uh, heritage there and uh, I, I didn't really have, I wasn't driven, if you will, to any branch of the service or any particular job. I just wanted to go in, serve my country and, you know, have fun. So it, uh, it, it, my, my story was turned by the, uh, stepfather of the girl I was dating at the time. And so, you know, I'm 17 getting ready to go on 18 and knew that I wanted to go in the army. And so the girl I was dating at the time, her stepfather had been in the Marines for two years, two tours in Vietnam, got out, went in the army, was alert for a year there. So very quiet, unassuming guy, you know, short, um, the true leatherneck. Um, But when he took his boots off until I knew what it was, I, I thought, you know, the sewage was leaking. Uh, in the house, you know, he literally had that trench foot from, you know, three years in Vietnam. And when I, when I mentioned it, I said, man, you guys need to call a plumber. You know, they all just giggled their butts off because they knew what it was. <laughs> but uh, I, I tease Fred a little bit, but he was very instrumental. He, you know, he sat down with me. My parents were very kind of hands off, you know, Hey, do what you want. You know, we think it's a good idea, but you know, you make the call. And so I sat down with Fred one day and I told him, you know, man, I, I really enjoy, you know, what, what you did. And I, I think I want to do that. I want to go in the 82nd Airborne and jump out of airplanes and all excited. He's like, no, no, dude, that's not what you want to do. And I, I don't, you know, at 18 years old, you're easily persuaded. So he said, uh, Steve, you know, you want to do that waft. Yeah, I couldn't even spell it. Waft, I know what's that? That's warrant officer flight training. I don't know what a warrant officer is and I don't have a college degree. So obviously there's no way I can go in flying. And uh, so he told me about the program and, and even more importantly, he described exactly what would happen um, when I went down and talked to the recruiter. Uh, yep. You're going to go into the recruiter. The first thing I'm going to tell you is that's great. We all American, we want to have you, but what you want to do is enlist as a crew chief, get some aviation experience and then apply to warrant. 
And I'm like, that's what they're going to say. Goes, yep. I know they will. And uh, so I went down there and uh, I was in Fort Meade, Maryland and went down and talked with, and I'll never forget her staff Sergeant Nielsen. And she was very pleasant to look at, which is probably <laughs> why, you know, I, I continued to, to <laughs> go back for seven months to, to get everything done. And so she gave me that exact spiel. Hey, you know, you need to come in and be a crew chief. And I'm like, well, how about if we try it my way first? You know, and she persuaded me and persuaded me and I just didn't give in. So finally she said, okay, well, you know, we'll go through with it. And the reason being is because they have such a small percentage of success. So they put all this effort into it and then they don't get you through. And then, you know, you go back and either you enlist or you don't do anything. And so they're, they're out a lot of time and effort. So, you know, it, it's a business I, and I understand. Um, so it, it worked out for seven months and uh, I got accepted in. And, you know, w- one of the things that I go back and I look at now is um, I look at my packet, you know, from my letter of why I want to be a warrant officer pilot to my reference letters to my grades from high school to my letters of recommendations. And, you know, usually everyone's got a a stellar story to tell. Oh, I got, you know, Senator John Glenn to write me a letter of recommendation, or I had, you know, 4.0, or, you know, I had just, uh, you know, won a scholarship to Harvard and I decided to do this. And mine was very uneventful. You know, I look at the photo now and, you know, I had split hair with a Sears, you know, sucker suit on there with plaid, uh, pockets on and just, I thought it was very un, unimpressive. And I was like, man, if I had been on that board, would I have selected me? But, you know, when I go back and, and, and look at it and, and I read, I read the, um, the letter that I wrote to why I wanted to be there, you know, it, it was, uh, I, and I wrote it myself and, but Fred kind of told me, you know, Hey, make sure you highlight on these areas. And, uh, I, I, I liked the letter. You know, I will yeah. pat myself on the back for the letter because that's what I'm sure got me in. Because, you know, the letters of recommendation from my neighbor, <laughs> from my uh, from my employer, you know, at a <laughs> at a Shell gas station, yeah. And Fred, you know, E7 in the army, just you know, weren't that impressive compared to you know what others put in there. Sure. So. Well, um, at that time, as you're getting in, this is early mid eighties, you're young, right? This is the 18 to 19 year old time frame coming in as a warrant officer, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, as you come in and I guess maybe before I get to that, as you look back now, do you have any second thoughts of like, maybe I should have gone the ground route. Maybe I should have jumped out of airplanes and been on the other side. Do you ever think about that? I'm a firm believer in everything happens for a reason. And, you know, 31 and a half years in the army. Um, I, I don't, I don't have any regrets. I don't wish I had done something different. There, there's other things that I wish I had done, you know, to continue to do more and more, but, you know, at a certain point, man, you just, you know, you're at a point where you can't give any more, you can't go someplace else, you know? Yeah. And so I, I think I maximize the fun. Um, I did have other opportunities, you know, I took the, uh, instance exam for West point while I was in basic and I was about maybe six weeks out from graduation from, uh, warrant officer, uh, flight school and the tax brought me in, which is never good. You know, when you go to see the, the tax officers, you've done something wrong. And they said, Hey, candidate lapping, we got this approval here. You've been accepted into West point. You know, and they're like, hey, great, you know, and clapping their hands. And I'm like, uh-huh. Am I guaranteed aviation? They're like, absolutely not. And I'm like, nah, no, thank you. You know, uh-huh. I, I had d- just done nine months to, to not do that. And uh, and I was very proud, you know, of, of what I had done up to that point. So I didn't do that. And maybe that's something, you know, that, I mean, hell, a great education and, and experience, but I, I don't regret not doing it. Yeah. No, I don't blame you. So when you come in, if you can, I, I want to make sure that we touch on a lot of the aircraft that you flew just over that long of a career. I'm sure it's been many, but as you join, you get through um, all the training. What's the first aircraft you're in? And then when is it you start hearing about this 160th thing? So in flight school, 
um, I started off in the 55, you know, the TH 55 Osage, and that was fun. And then we went into Huey's and, you know, with a turbine, big old helicopter. I mean, just, just a blast, really enjoyed that. Um, but the Cobra was out there. We didn't have, you know, the, the Apache yet. It, it, I think it was, it was in its planning stages, but definitely wasn't an option for a, uh, a transition. And so as we got closer and closer uh, to being able to pick what aircraft, I, I knew that I wanted to fly the Cobra. You know, I wanted to fly something that could shoot back. You know, I, I didn't play all those years with army men, you know, so I couldn't shoot back at something. And so when it came time, you know, we're sitting there in the, uh, the student classroom and they put uh, pictures of each of the aircraft. And I think we had one Chinook, four Blackhawks, uh, eight or 10 Cobras, and then the rest were Hueys. Nice. So I wanted to be one of those Cobras. And so, you know, they go through and the top guy picks the Chinook and the other tops pick their Blackhawks. And when it comes to me, you know, I said, okay, I want the Cobra. And they said, okay, qualified, because there were a couple of people that, that um, for whatever reason, you know, weren't qualified to, to fly the Cobra, you know, it's profile psychological, I guess. Um, so I was all excited and happy. Well, no one was picking the scout route. And so the arrow scout route is that you can either do it two ways. You go through the arrow scout course while you're in flight school, and then you go to a unit as an arrow scout, or you go to the arrow scout course, and then you go to the Cobra course. And, you know, you're a, a much better rounded uh, Cobra pilot because you know the scout mission, the guys who are in front of you looking for things who are then telling you what to shoot. But it was a lot of work we had been told too. So, you know, at, at that point you had two paths. You could either go the Huey path, which was going down to the beach every weekend and drinking and, you know, partying, or there was the scout, which you're, you know, you're in your room studying and, and it was very hard. So no one wanted to do that. So they didn't, of course, they didn't have enough people pick scout. So, you know, the company commanders up there, all right, who wants to be an all American red blooded scout pilot, you know, and I just couldn't help myself. Oh, I do. I do. <laughs> so I went through the aero scout course with anticipation of then going through the Cobra course after graduation. Well, um, it, with good intentions from the army, but, uh, after I graduated, now I room with, uh, two other people. Uh, two friends from school. One was going to go to the Blackhawk course and the other one was going to go to the Cobra course. And now, you know, th this is the eighties. There wasn't a lot of money. Um, they got behind on maintenance. They got behind because of weather. So after being the museum tour guide for six weeks, they're like lapping, get in here. I'm like, Oh, here we go. Hey, you're leaving Fort Rucker. I'm like, I am, but I even have my Cobra transition and you're not gonna. So you're not going to Fort Riley as a Cobra pilot anymore. You're going to Fort Bliss as a scout pilot. And when we get caught back up, then you can come back as a Cobra pilot. You know, by now I'm just bored. And I want to get out of Rucker. So I said, okay, great. That sounds, you know, perfect. And so, you know, my, my first um, aspirations of being an attack pilot didn't pan out. And so what, I go to my first scout unit platform? as a scout. Yeah. What the was OH, the OH 58 Alpha Charlie? Yeah. They okay. didn't have the Delta out yet by then. Got it. All right. And disheartening, it sounds like just a little bit. I mean, you, did they have guns on those at the time? No, th they had some of the units had uh, Stinger missiles, you know, air to air. But I guess it, it was kind of, um, you know, equaled in good and bad. So the bad was, you know, that I wasn't going to fly attack. But the good was <laughs> when I got to El Paso. The third ACR didn't have a lot of money and, you know, we weren't high priority with three core. And so we had uh, Hueys, 58s and Cobras and the Hueys flew because they needed to support the rest of the ACR. The 58s flew because they were cheap, to, you know, fix and, and to fly and the Cobras, not so much. So I made PIC probably in about six, seven months, along with my stick buddies. Jeez in flight school. And so, you know, because they didn't have, we didn't have a lot of pilots. I mean, we were short um, and, and I didn't know any better. I figured, Oh, this is how the army is. Um, so we make PIC, you know, and now we're told, okay, you're, 
your mission for today on your flight is to take the Cobra pilots up and let them remember what it's like to be in a helicopter. Ah. Like, uh, okay. So, you know, it was fun. I got a razz on them a little bit, but you know, that wasn't like for a couple months, that was long-term, you know, for yeah. a year or two, excuse me. Well, it was about a year. And then they finally come back and they said, Hey, Steve, come over to S3 shop. So I go over to the S3 shop and they're like, Hey, great news. We got a Cobra transition slot for you. And I'm like, uh, yeah, no, wow. because it wasn't going to get any better, you know, mm-hmm. and they they just didn't fly at all. And it was, you know, I, I, I preferred to fly than, you know, to fly the Cobra. Mm-hmm. Where, where does 160th enter the picture? When do you first hear about it? So by that time, you know, there was a lot of things and I'll just refer to it, you know, as the big army. Um, several things were weighing on me that, you know, when we went out to the field, I'm W1 lapping and I'm putting up a GP medium with CW4, Vietnam helicopter pilot. And the only difference between he and I is he got to pick first where he's going to put his cod in the tent. And, you know, and I'm just thinking to myself, man, that's not a lot of career advancement right there, you know? And so I, I was beginning to question if I wanted to stay in the army. You know, my commitment was four years uh, after flight school at the time. And, you know, now I'm going on two years and, you know, at about the third year mark, I'm just, uh, I enjoyed the army, but you know, it's not like I, I deployed anywhere, you know, we went to NTC and we had went to reforger. Yeah. So reforger was, was quite the, you know, uh, experience. I really enjoyed that, but then it went back to, you know, going back to the sandbox at home and, and just not really doing a lot. So I had, uh, started looking at other options and actually I had met my now wife, uh, girlfriend at the time, uh, through the University of Texas at El Paso ROTC program. I'd went over there to do a static display. And uh, it was kind of funny. You know, I, I just flew the aircraft over there and my troop commander was the one who was going to talk to all the ROTC cadets because he was a commissioned officer. But he wasn't real much. He wasn't a real sociable person. So, I, you know, I wound up talking to everybody. You know, I was, I'm, I'm a people person. So I was always, you know, talking and uh, wound up talking with a group and you know one of them being my wife and so that's the story how i met my wife that's a great one i know you didn't ask but i'm gonna throw that i like it you might get upset yeah (laughs) but then while i'm over there i you know wind up talking with the air force rotc instructor and so i applied to go into the uh air force rotc program and and that's what she was in. That, that's the, the program they had. And so I said, okay, well, you know, this, this will be great. I was going to go to the aviation program and, you know, fly F-16s or something. And about two, maybe three months later, we get noticed that there's a recruiting team coming down. And at the time, they were the still the 160 SOAG, Special Operations Airborne Group, and not the regiment before they came a regiment. And so. Um, you know, I, I, I really didn't know who these guys were, you know, and someone said, Oh yeah, you know, they do this. I'm like, eh, it's a half day off at work. I go to the theater and get to listen to them, you know, all right, I'll go listen to them. And so, you know, without really any, um, uh, purpose, I went down there and, you know, they put the video on there and they talked about their local flying area, you know, with a picture of the, uh, the globe, the world, and just kind (laughs) of caught my attention. I'm like, you know what, that's why I came in the army right there, you know, to do things like that, uh, whether it's, you know, on the ground or in aviation. So really that recruiting team, you know, saved me from getting out of the army. And and that was a, a very pivotal moment in my aviation, my army career. Did you go right? Was that like, you just raised your hand, put your packet in and went, or was this years later before you actually get your foot in? No, I, I had, um, you know, I was that young scout pilot, you know, when I got to the unit, I was 20 years old. Um, two years later, I went to the instructor pilot course and, you know, I'm the one who's always wanting to to fly NVGs. You know, I'm the one who wants to, you know, go out and do this. Um, and 
it was, I always wanted to do more, you know, and you know, the SIP has got his hand on my forehead. Whoa, hold down there young. And so I just wanted to do more and more. And then when the team came there, I went right up to him and said, Hey, you know, I'm within a year of uh, de-roasting of getting out or PCS. And um, these are my qualifications. And they said, Hey, you're about right where we're looking at. You know, they wanted a thousand hours, total time, a hundred hours of goggles. And, and that's a, just about where I was at. Yeah. Um, so that was, shoot, that was uh, September, excuse me, September of 89. And um, they said, okay, come on up. We're going to have you come up real, real soon. And so I go up there. It's like at the end of October, maybe beginning of November to do my assessment. And, you know, I thought this was the coolest thing, which was just TDY, which means that they paid for me to fly somewhere by myself. I got my own rental car, you know, and, you know, so, you know, how junior I was, right? I'm like, <laughs> I can't believe they give me my own rental car. These people are crazy. You know, and I'm 23 at the time now. So I just said, I'm going to do it day to day, phase by phase. Um, I had really beefed up you know, in that limited time that I had in between when they came and when I had to go there, I was studying my butt off. Um, I went out and flew as many goggle hours as I could, did the navigation like I knew that they were going to expect. And so when I got up there, I didn't have any illusions, you know, that I was the greatest pilot or, you know, that I was going to out PT anyone. Um, I've always considered myself very average, you know, but a good, um, well-rounded individual, if you will. So as a, as a pilot uh, officer, I thought I was a pretty good pilot. You know, I, I knew what I was doing. Um, I was okay, physical shape, you know, good swimmer. So using, utilizing that whole man concept, I thought I had a chance. But, you know, as soon as you get into something like the uh, PT test, you know, and, and doing pull-ups and other things like that, it just, you know, I did okay, but when there's people lapping me, you know, I'm like, oh man, these guys are studs, you know, they, and you know, no shit. They're triathletes. They're, you know, yeah. human specimens of just goodness. And, uh, and Steve's <laughs> not, but you know, one thing I I'm not a quitter, you know, and, and they'd have to, you know, drag me off the, the, the racetrack or, you know, pull me out of the water. And, and I've always been a pretty good swimmer. So, as he, as I did each event, you know, they don't give you any encouragement. You don't really know what the standards are. Uh, and, and the recruiter, he could tell I was feeling a little bad about myself after the run, you know, cause I was probably one of the last guys and he goes, Hey man, you know, don't quit. I said, okay. You know, and that kind of motivated me and went on. I did, uh, I, I thought I did well on the flight test. I found my target, you know, which is most people don't you know, as I got into the unit later and I assessed people, you know, that, that's a pretty tough thing to do. And that's navigation, Steve, when you say find your target, that's like a long distance nav target to right. find. Right. So what you're expected to do is to plan a mission and they give you a, okay, you're going to go to here and they're, they're airports, but they're airports in the sense that they're airports technically, you know, it's a grass strip out there in the middle of more grass. So unless you've been there or you've seen, you know, satellite imagery of it, guess what? It looks like grass. And at that time, you know, there was no satellite imagery or anything. There's no GPS. It's a, it's a map. It's a stopwatch and it's a compass and it's hopefully some good planning. Well, you know, I'm amazed. I, I do the assessments um, in an MH6 and, you know, this is a, cool ass helicopter. It's a black helicopter with, you know, doodads and, you know, gizmos on it. And I'm, I'm just real impressed with it. So as I'm navigating, I'm talking with the instructor pilot, the ass assessing officer. And I'm like, I'm just talking with him and I'm just BSing with him the whole time, you know, asking him questions. And I know he's thinking, you know, cause they don't help you at all. I know he's probably thinking, man, this guy needs to shut up and concentrate on what he's doing. But I'm like, yeah, man. So, you know, what are you guys doing? To, hey, make a left up here at this intersection, you know, and bang, yeah, we hit our target plus or minus 30 seconds, which I could kind of tell pissed them off, you know, because, <laughs> you know, they want to be able to keep their their score up, right? 
So we went to the second one, which was even a more difficult target. And I landed in the vicinity of it, but I didn't land right on that particular strip of grass. So anyways, it was a successful um, uh, flight eval. Well, it it was unsuccessful because I didn't hit the second one. But, you know, as far as being compatible with the unit, it uh, it went pretty good. Dang. Um, when, so I guess just a couple of things as you've been talking here, uh, for people who aren't familiar with the aviation side of things, you mentioned being, becoming a PIC in six or seven months. It's a huge deal. That's pilot in command. That's the, the one individual in the aircraft who's responsible for the safety of that aircraft, basically. And it's something that you work towards. I'd, I'd say it's, it varies depending on the aircraft, but it's six to seven months sounds like a pretty fast transition and an IP in two years. So an instructor pilot, you're training other people in the unit, how to fly also very quick in two years. So super impressive that no surprise then you did pretty well when you were there for that, um, for that selection process. You know, it, and, and everyone, you know, is humble and, and everyone in the unit is, you know, and if you, if you came up and asked me, Hey, are you a good pilot? I'm like, ah, you know, I can hold my own. But um, yeah. to be a flight lead in the unit, you know, you know, you're good because if you're not and you don't exert that, someone's going to challenge you, you know, your decisions. And so it, it, that's a learned skill. But even, you know, kind of going backwards through flight school, <laughs> again, you know, it goes back to my grades in high school. I didn't have good study habits. And so when we would uh, take an exam, you know, on eight aerodynamics, uh, whatever it was, specifically i remember weather so warrant officer candidate lapping fails the weather test the only one in my class and so they're like oh oh yeah hey candidate this isn't good you need to come back two days study and take another version of it like roger got it and you know and this time you had a prescribed area to study at a prescribed time it's uh 1900 hours study 2000 hours done you know and and i just couldn't do it and uh you know i'm not the dumbest guy but i'm also not the smartest and at the time my my just study skills were horrible so i go in i take the b version of the test and fail it and uh <laughs> so now i'm called back into i spent some time in the tac offices for various reasons <laughs> but I, I go into the tac office and they're like uh mm, can it laugh and we got a problem i'm like yeah, yeah. And that did I pass? And like, no. I'm like, oh, what do we do now? And like, well, we don't know because no one has ever failed twice, you know. <laughs> and so, it, you know, I, I went and I I went back, studied my butt off, but then I went back and they didn't have three uh, versions of the test, so I took you know A again, probably got a seventy two on it, and, <laughs> and and moved on. That's so great. Just, but the one thing that saved me, I guess I said all that is, you know, all my friends would get, uh, you know, 95s, 90s and like, hey, Steve, what'd you get? You know, and I'm like, yeah, man, 81, you know, but when it came time for the light evaluations, you know, oh, I got an 87. No, oh, I got an 85. Steve, what'd you get? 94. You know, so it, the the flying is what always saved me, um, fortunately, because like yeah. I said, I wasn't any Einstein. Is there something... It- I mean, that doesn't come naturally to everybody. I don't know if you're not to to say that it did come naturally to you, but do you feel like there was anything that you had done growing up that, or or something about the way you think about flying that made you just a little bit better at times? I think at a certain point, I was just able to relax, um, you know, and, and just, you know, let my body, you know, exhale, if you will. And just kind of feel the aircraft. And it always felt very natural to me. You know, it felt like something you could, uh, you know, wear, you know, like a piece of clothing. And so, you know, I've flown a lot of different aircrafts and um, I just never, flying has always been natural to me. Although, you know, I I didn't start off as an, at a young age and, you know, it wasn't always something that I aspired to do. It's just something that I thought uh, uh, came naturally to me. Yeah. You adapted to it pretty well, huh? Yeah. Um, so you start off flying AHs, is that right? You move to MHs and then back. Did I get that? No. No. So, you know, I, again, to go back to flight school, I wanted to fly Cobras. Well, I, I didn't for four years in the CAV because, you know, 
of the reasons stated. So when I assessed for the regiment, they said, okay, well, you know, what do you want to assess for? A eight sixes. I want to fly the attack. I've been wanting to do that. And they're like, denied. I'm like, oh man. They said, uh, you know, what would you say if we put you in Chinooks? I'm like, man, I'd go fly Chinooks, you know, whatever you guys need me to do. I'll, you know, sweep the floors, drive a deuce and a half, which is what they want to hear. Um, and and I've never really been, you know, oh, I'm an attack guy. You know, that's just, you know, was was never me. One, because I wasn't at the time. And so they said, well, you don't have any uh, attack skills. And at the time, you know, they were just bringing on Cobra guys. Most of the guys were, were Cobras. So I assess, get accepted into um, the 160th. And when I assessed, it was just prior they were doing rehearsals for Panama for Just Cause, 1989. Matter of fact, when they asked me on the board, well, give us a current event. Um, uh, well, this Panama thing's heating up. What do you know about Panama? What do you know about our involvement? You know, and I, whoa, man, this is sensitive. I, I don't know anything. Because they must just be doing got something done. here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they just got done. So anyway, so when I uh, reported to the unit in March, you know, they had just gotten uh, back, you know, a month before or back in January. And so the psychiatrist told us all, hey, you know, these guys may still be a little wound up. Our company commander was shot in the shoulder. Um, we had a couple of aircraft, you know, that crashed uh, on the Modelo prison. You know, we had one of the AHs shot down, both pilots killed. And so, you know, here I am, this, you know, young what was I, uh, you know, 23, 24 at the time and coming there. And, you know, these guys were, you know, they were the real deal. And yeah. so as I came in, whether they were a W2 or, you know, a W4, um, these guys had a lot of experience and, and I had a lot to learn and they let me know it too. You know, they kept you on, on a short leash. And so the, uh, the first, shoot what was it about five months was going through green platoon and uh that was the hardest thing i've ever done in my aviation career yeah could it, you know i don't know how sensitive it is but if you could just share overall kind of what green platoon is i obviously have heard of this um but for people who haven't yeah and, and it's changed because at that time again this was early um 1990 and the regiment hadn't yet formed the official SOAT-C or SOAT-B now, the Special Operations Aviation Training Battalion. So it was just called Green Platoon. And each of the companies was responsible for training their own pilots. And so what they would do is there was two pilots going through, me and my stick buddy, Keith. And he was a W-3 Cobra pilot and I was a W-2 Scout pilot. And so, you know, he was a little bit more experienced than I was. Um, and <laughs> adjustment, I guess, would be the, the word to describe because there was a um, uh, there was an agenda to get us through, but there wasn't necessarily, you know, a, a written procedure of how we were going to do things day in, day out. And so what would happen is two instructor pilots would come in, and they'd, you know, give us a mission and then we would do the mission, we would plan it. We'd come in the next day to brief it with two different instructor pilots. These are all green suitors, guys from the company. And, you know, so when you don't have a, a uh, written POI program of instruction or a standard operating procedure for it, uh, there's a lot of discrepancies, you know, so we get yelled at a lot. Well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? And would it have mattered if we said, well, the other IPs told us to do it this way. No one wants to hear your excuses. So, you know, you just sucked it up and you just, you know, bit the bullet for, I mean, four months. It was like that, you know, and just and and I figured it was all, you know, um, rhyme and reason. You know, they're trying to, to test you. And a lot of it was. But just going through the aircraft qualification you know, doing the night vision goggle qualification and doing the uh, tactics. And so just one story on the, uh, well, two stories. So coming from big army, if you broke something, boy, you better be prepared, you know, to, to stand before the man and, and get out your checkbook. Well, the, uh, the unit was different because I was out there starting an aircraft 
And, you know, I advance, it's a modulated start on the throttle, meaning that you have to manipulate it manually to keep the temperature between a certain uh, limit. And when I advanced the throttle, it really didn't do anything. And so the emergency procedure or the start procedure is abort start, get somebody to check it out. There's something wrong. It's not getting enough fuel. Well, as I get to that point, you know, you always do the old look over at the instructor pilot. He's like, go ahead and give it a little more. So I advance the throttle a little bit more and wham, you know, we overtemp the engine. And I'm like, oh my God, now I've done it. You know, I, I shouldn't have listened to, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to get in trouble. And, and he's just like, okay, we'll shut it down. What's our spare? You know, you've got it written down, uh, 623. Okay, go pre-flight 623. I'll go, uh, you know, uh, change our flight plan. And that was the extent of overtemping an engine. I get done with the day. And my stick buddy had was out doing touchdown autos and chopped the tail boom off. And, you know, he thought it was the end of his career. Yeah. And all, and all they did was like, uh, are we off to the side enough? Yeah. Okay. What's the spare? Uh, we don't have one. Lapping took it. Okay. Well, we'll get another one, you know, and literally we went back out. Both of us flew, you know, no pee and bleeding. And uh, it's not like that now, you know, it's much yeah. more uh, strict on that, but that was kind of the, the, the vision into the unit and, you know, how they did things differently. That's great. And, and so I didn't, so were you guys, did you come out flying Chinooks then? Was it MHs? What did you end up flying right out of the gate? The, the MH6. The, the little MH. Bird. Yeah. So I stayed there. So just before we jump into some of the operational work, could you share with people, cause we've interviewed Greg Coker from an age six side. What are some of the differences that you might experience if you're flying the MH versus AH? Any anything personality wise that you would look for differently in the pilot um, mission profiles? If you can share, just for people who are aware, obviously it's a little bird. One is designed, I understand, Steve. So just keep me straight here. One is an attack platform, the AH six. The MH is more of a transport type aircraft. But could you just share a little more of like what? What's in the details between those two? Sure. So the MH6 standing for, you know, mission. Uh, and as you said, I wouldn't call it transportation. I'd call it, you know, just a multitude of different missions that it can do. And so the best way that I can answer that is when I was a liaison officer with the ground force in Baghdad uh, during, you know, when Ramadi and Fallujah were hot and I'm watching these little birds go to the rooftops in Baghdad, Ramadi, Fallujah, just the awesomeness of what they did, you know? And so the AH does kind of one job. It shoots at things, you know, and that's what it does now. All right. Well, it shoots miniguns. It shoots 50 cows. It shoots rockets, but it, it's kind of, you know, and I flew it for 11 years, so I'm not talking bad about it, but I'm just saying, um, well, to go back, the Rangers would come up to me when I was an MH6 pilot and they're like, Hey, how long do you have to fly this before you can go over to the AHs? You know, like, hey, <laughs> shut up, get out of here, Ranger. You know, and it, it, the the MH pilots are some of the you know the best pilots there are. You know, and they'll put that thing down anywhere. And it always amazed me to watch the assault guys go into a HLZ that's just dustier than hell, or a rooftop that's got people sleeping up there with mattresses coming up into the rotor blades or the tail rotors or wires. I, I don't know how many aircraft we left on the top of the building, you know, on ops. I'm serious. And, you know, then we got so good at DART, which is a downed aircraft recovery team, that we had a Blackhawk come in, hook up a little bird and fly it out of there. And those were all the MH6s because they're doing the dirty work, you know. And so the, the difference between an MH6 and AH6 is mission only. You know, the, the pilots are, are uh, very similar. A lot of them, the MH guys were Cobra guys or 58D. So they had all shot, you know, they, they were uh, attack guys. Um, the, the mission set, you always need somebody to shoot. But, you know, sometimes the MH6s weren't needed. You know, they have a very specific uh, niche. You know, if you want to go to a street or an alleyway and land or a rooftop, or if you want to hide something, then, you know, they, they're the ones that you go to. If you want to shoot something, you can kind of pick between the DAP, which is the armed Blackhawk or the AH-6. So just different mission sets. Yeah. 
Perfect. Great context. So catch me if I, if I got this wrong, but just looking at your career, Steve, you mentioned Panama as you're going through Green Platoon. You've got Somalia in 93, you've got Gulf War as well, and 9-11. And I, I, are we talking 15 to 17 years since you've been in until you actually get into combat the first time? Did I, Am I reading the background correctly there? Yeah, it might have been hard to to read, you know, with my tears dropping on the, ah! the paper on there, some things. But but so, I, I did so, I wanted to I just wanted to ask on that because how how difficult that could be psychologically. When when you've come in, you're at the tip of the spear and possibly not because you didn't have the opportunity, but there were good reasons for it. Sure. But I, I as you talk through this, I'd just be interested, how did you manage that? Um, so, you know, as with any young man that wants to, to come in and challenge themselves, you know, test their mettle, um, that's why I came in the army. And so after I'm serving, you know, and, uh, I didn't know prime chance, you know, in the mid eighties, that only the task force was doing things like that operating, uh, you know, in, in, the, the Persian Gulf, but, uh, operation just cause, you know, we were a low priority unit in three corps, so we didn't go to that. So that's the first thing I missed. Well, then I go to the 160th and I'm sitting at the, <laughs> I'm sitting in the middle of SEER course at Fort Bragg. Why the instructors come up to and like, okay, everyone come around. We're going to start pulling people out because you've heard that Iraq invaded Kuwait and we're going to start needing you. And I'm like, Man, all right, my, you know, I'm I've already been through Green Platoon in the for the M86, so you know I'm like, well, I need to go and start packing up my stuff. So th they pull the SF guys out, they pull the Rangers out, they pull out the Marine uh, Force Recon guys, and then lapping, yeah, not so much. They didn't oh. need Steve, so <laughs> Steve stays there and finishes the SEER course, and so I miss the initial. Um, desert storm or desert shield desert storm and so now i'm a little upset or you know just disappointed i guess because yeah. the third acr where i just came from they all deployed well you know later their horror stories of how they didn't do anything and it was just miserable it made me feel a little bit better yeah but um when i got out of seer course we had split up into a b and c groups you know the a deployed first the senior guys the b guys were on standby and then the C, you know, was probably half full because we didn't have anybody, you know, and I think we may have had a World War II vet they threw in at us or something. I mean, <laughs> the C group was not going anywhere. And that's where old Steve was at. So one of the guys was having a baby and they decided, OK, we're going to bring him home and someone's going to go relieve him. And I was a BMQ at the time. So there's three levels of pilots, basic mission qualified, fully mission qualified and flight lead. And I was a BMQ at the time. And the guy who was coming back was a BMQ. And so the only people that were back that weren't on the uh, B team was Keith and I. And so we had to go in there and report to our commander and explain to him why we should go and replace this guy. You know, we're in competition. And uh, my, my boss was a little bit of a hothead and goes, all right. We got this opportunity for you guys to go and relieve, you know, Chuck overseas. And first off, do you guys want to do it? And we're like, yes, sir. Good, because if you wouldn't, I would have fired your ass right here. You know, and we're just like, <laughs> oh man, this guy is crazy. And he was. <laughs> but uh, so he chose Keith because he was a CW3. So Keith deploys over to um to Iraq, we'll call it that. We based out of someplace else. Yeah. And you know, Steve still doesn't have a combat patch. And, you know, Steve's one of the few guys in the unit who hasn't seen anything. So that's, that's strike two on me. Well, then 1993 comes around for uh, operation. Well, it wasn't, you know, Gothic serpent at the time, Somalia. And so I had just progressed from FMQ to flight lead. So now, you know, I'm doing good and I'm progressing, you know, very quick, but I'm the junior flight lead. And so when they start making up the deployment, you know, they're going to take the senior guy. So they take the senior flight lead, the senior FMQs who were my peers, but, you know, I kind of, I progressed to the next level, but I'm now, you know, I'm starting over again. 
So I'm not on the deployment package. And I'm like, well, this kind of sucks. But my boss came to me and goes, well, your wife's pregnant. You're not going anyway. You know, she's due in, in November. We don't know how long this is going to be gone. So um, the Battle of the Black Sea, you know, goes on. We lost, you know, a lot of good uh, night stalkers, a lot of good uh, rangers and, and special forces guys during that uh, very difficult time. Did great things, you know, and I'll just mention, you know, what the, the Little Bird guys did. You know, the, the AHs, you don't hear much from them on the movies or anything, but you know, they flew their butts off and uh, did did a lot of great attack stuff. But the MH6 guys, my uh, my stick buddy, you know, they're the ones that landed in the street next to the Black Hawk carrying, you know, wounded SF dudes out of there. So just the uh, the greatest amount of respect for those guys, for everybody, you know, yeah, Black Hawk. 100%. But, yeah. So, you know, that's the third one. On a personal note, that's the third one that Steve, you know, misses out on. Yep. And with that, Steve, could could you share what's the morale like when that unit comes back? Everybody's seen the movie. Um, you can only imagine, but d- just be in there. What was that like? It. I knew we lost guys, you know, and, and I knew a lot of them, um, but it didn't. It doesn't hit you until they come back. And the, the thing that struck me most is that um, the guys are crying because they felt like they didn't do enough, yeah. you know, to uh, to bring everybody home. And as I get older and removed from the unit, you know, I get more emotional, you know, thinking about that. But while I was there, you know, it, you didn't show those emotions if you didn't have to because you had a job to do. But uh, – I just remember, you know, going up to them and, you know, thanking them and, you know, hey, you guys did an awesome job. And every one of them just said, hey, I'm sorry. God. Yeah, I just, you know, broke your heart. Yeah. One of the uh, recent interviews I did was with this guy, Aiden Aslan, who was uh, held for five months in Russia. He's a, a Brit who was fighting for the Ukrainians, captured and used as propaganda piece. And as I was talking to him, one of the things that came to mind was uh, Michael Durant, where that was one of, I'm not saying it's the only one, but like a very early POW in a different era, like where you have TV going on right. at the same time. And this guy, Aiden, in my opinion, was also a new era of POW of the social media time where right. he has a huge online presence. So if you can imagine going through Sears school where they knew everything about you, as opposed to just name rank serial number you can't get away with that anymore you know so it's different and and so it just made me think back to durant and the pictures of his face at the time and uh yeah i can't imagine what it would have been like to be you know shoulder to shoulder with those guys coming back and being part of that unit that's special and and difficult obviously um with that steve if we look at the if you could take us to maybe the first time that you're in combat where where do you find because we just talked about all this time but it's not right. like you miss out on combat obviously like there's a lot you've spent your time in in uh in that seat so what's the first time that you remember being uh outside the wire in that sense well, um so where were we 93 so i leave uh a company flying the mh6 i go for three years down in central america flying the Black Hawk with Delta Company. We've got a small five company uh, detachment down there. Um, there's a couple ops that come up down there. And and I just, this is just kind of more, you know, stuff that Steve didn't do, you know, and <laughs> it, it does, I think it goes uh, like 15, 2002 was the first time I deployed to a combat theater. And so in 2001, um, last story that I'm not in <laughs> is, uh, is OEF deployments. And so now I've gone from Black Hawks, now I'm flying. Now, so after 15 years of trying to fly attack aircraft, when I get done, and, and the regiment's real good, if you're doing a good job and you want to do something different and you're giving back, then, you know, they're very open to switching aircraft. 
And so, you know, I, I flew aircraft through, flew the Black Hawk for three years, got done. They were kicking us out of Panama anyway. And they said, okay, well, where do you want to go after Panama? And I said, well, I want to finally go back to B Company and fly the AH. And so they said, okay, you can do that. And so as I get there, now I'm the junior BMQ again, and um, 9-11 happens. And so I've progressed enough where I'm the senior BMQ, meaning that by all rights, I don't know if it's in the Constitution or what, but I should be going on this deployment. And I am right up to the point where, you know, they get together and they like, hey, we need another maintenance guy in this, really. So lapping you're off. So I don't go to uh, OEF for the initial, you know, uh, deployment of that. And I understand, you know, again, disappointing. So 15 years, I finally get to fly. Uh, I'm in the attack aircraft and then, you know, uh, miss one more. The first time I did go, I went to, uh, to OEF as a liaison guy for Siege of Soda. And um, I got back at some of the guys who deployed for OEF because they started giving out bonuses and Steve got somehow, you know, outsmarted everyone. Like I said, I'm not real smart, maybe until, you know, it comes to something that, you know, interests me. So I found out that if I signed for my bonus overseas, I got it tax free. So you know, uh -huh. the, the boss came by and goes, Hey, I know none of you want to do this, but anyone who wants to be a liaison guy, you know, and, and I thought about it and I did some quick math. And I I'll do it. I'm like, <laughs> really? You want to do it? I'm like, yeah. Okay. Then everyone gets together and they're like, why would Lapping want to do that? This is oh, that son of a bitch, you know? So I, uh, I, I got over for once. And uh, anyway, I did 90 days over in Bagram uh, watching the, the Chinook guys and the, the DAPs, you know, just do some incredible things. Uh, and that's my only deployment in Afghanistan. So my big uh, combat deployment, which I, you know, earned a, uh, a combat patch was, working 12 hour shifts and a talk and uh, <laughs> being a little uncomfortable, but getting the tax free money. So that's important too. Yeah, that was, yeah. you know, that was good. That was good. When I came back uh, March of 2003, of course, you know, Iraq invades, uh, uh, or, or I'm sorry, we, we set up to invade Iraq and it was all hands on. I mean, everybody was going. And I was a new FMQ AH guy by this time. And so um, there was just no way I wasn't going to do this, you know, and, and I was ready to, you know, <laughs> I was ready to fight for this one. So we deploy, uh, we're just outside of Iraq. And our job was to uh, go out to the Western side of Iraq and fight the Vizobs, which is a vis visual observation post. And so we kind of knew what we were going to do before we went there. And so we did some train ups. And what we had done was we had made teams and the team consisted of one MH6 with a FLIR, two AH6s and two A10s. And our job and we had, you know, multiple teams and we had corridors on Western Iraq and we just flew the corridors and we cleared out the Vizobs, made sure no scuds were there. And you know, that was our, our initial while everyone else was concentrating on the primary push uh, out of Kuwait into Iraq. We were, you know, uh, TF Dagger with the ground SF guys, very low key out on the West, making sure that, you know, the Iraqis weren't able to draw uh, other countries into the war as well. The uh, There wasn't a lot of resistance, you know, we had uh, comment communications intercept. So we heard the Iraqis talking with the, these visual observation posts. And it was, uh, I remember it just being sad, you know, we dropped leaflets and said, Hey, we're going to come out here in a couple of days. You guys shouldn't be there. So they're calling back and like, Hey, you guys need to come get us. You know, the Americans are coming, you know, and their command is saying yeah, no. And if you leave, we'll kill you, you know? And, and it was just, you know, it was sad because you got to figure, you know, these are the lowest of the low in the Iraqi army that are out there. But, you know, it's a job to do. And um, it, 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 I was always able to detach myself like that. I, I didn't consider them, you know, people. Uh, you just, if in my 
um, you know, my thought process, I couldn't, I, it was a job. We were all professionals. Hell I'd been in the unit, you know, for quite some time and all the guys there were always, you know, professional. So it's, I don't remember us, especially in the beginning, you know, getting together and talking about our feelings. Well, what do you think? Should we do this? This doesn't seem right. It was like, man, sucks for those guys. And so that's tough. That's a tough call to make. I mean, it's not, it's not a hard call to make, I suppose you're going to do it, but that's not what you're imagining, right? When you are getting ready to go fly guns, it's, Hey, this guy's bad. Clearly I got to go after him. And yeah, that's a tough one. I've not heard that before. It's not one that, that we felt good about, you know, there's missions that I felt very good about because you knew what these people had done, you know, just evil people, but this was not one of them. How about, I, yeah, oh yeah, keep going, Steve, sorry. Oh, I just said, you know, but it wasn't really the the people or the enemy situation that, that really um, had me uh, concerned during those initial stages. It was, you know, we're in the western part of Iraq. We don't have very accurate weather forecasting. We don't have real good, you know maps or intel it was just kind of we'll go out you know and see what happens you know and like okay and you know as we flew out there i mean it was dark and i i think the most uh concerned hell i'll say scared you know i was scared was i I never really was scared and a a threat you know enemy or something like that because you know we had been trained i knew what to do you know it was usually not a fair fight. You know, we're bringing a machine gun to a knife fight. And uh, th- that never really bothered me. W- what most concerned me is going out in these blowing sandstorms with, you know, no visibility. Um, there's bad guys out there. And if we have to land, then what? You know, now we're kind of on our own. And that happened multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're out there. And uh, so I-, I said we had the corridors. And so we'd go out there and, you know, we'd talk to another team that was coming back and like, Hey, what's going on guys? Like, Oh man, weather's crap. We're going back. It's okay. Good luck. You know, and we keep going in the same direction, you know, and, and I was flying trail wingman at the time. I said, Hey, you know, everyone else is going back. Shouldn't we go back? Ah, We're just going to go up for a couple more minutes. And, you know, next thing you know, it's a, a blowing blizzard sandstorm, you know, that's just crazy. Um, one night we hit a, uh, a target is on like a, on a gas station. And again, you know, these are all very lightly defended. Um, no chance really of us being hurt from the enemy, but we, uh, we engaged this, uh, this objective area and I can't see anything after we do the engagement, you know, it's just bad. And so I'm flying with the company commander and I'm like, Hey, I don't see the ground anymore. He goes, Oh, I got it. So he grabs the controls, you know, okay. Woo. Yeah. Hey, you see lead. Nope. I don't see lead. We don't see the MH. And you know, now I can tell, do you really see the ground? There's no way you see the ground. Go, no, I lost it. So, ah. so, you know, now we're both fighting for the controls to try to keep us level. We're at 50 feet and we come up on a BRDM, just an old BRDM that's sitting there. I don't know if anyone's on it or not, but it gave me a, a, a visual reference. So I slammed the aircraft down and we're all, you know, whew, yeah, that was horrible. So now we're trying to call the rest of the team and there everybody's broken up because the sand was just bad. Um, but it, it's just something I remember, you know, that that happens a couple times a week and we did missions every night. It was just the west. The western part of Iraq was what scared me the most, just because of weather. It was just always horrible, and we, you know, it it, it didn't stop us from going. <laughs> wow, you know, I always find it difficult explaining to people how dangerous the weather is for a pilot, and it's just not. It's hard to understand. I think if you haven't been in it. And you hear ground guys who will go out in anything, you know, like it doesn't matter what the weather is. We're going to sleep out there. But there is something about the weather when you're flying that's really hard. I I don't know if you've had experience. I'm sure when you're the liaison officer for a siege of soda, you know, special forces, special ops task force, you're probably having to explain this regularly, the the impact of the weather. 
yeah, for folks that, who can't wrap their head around. That it. was the, probably the toughest thing I did, you know, and my philosophy was, so I, I did this job for 18 months, um, mainly to get promoted to CW5 because I'd never been out of the company. But so I live with the ground force for 90 days at a time and I'm the only aviation guy down there. So it's, it's me against them, you know, and if some, if we did something wrong, you know, they're up there making, you know, a little stick chart up Brown here, one, two, three wrong, you know? And so I'd get up there, you know, I'm like, there is no doubt that the people that we worked with and for were the greatest in the world. But, you know, I also recognize that no one, there's none better than the task force 160th uh, for helicopter pilots, you know, support personnel and everyone. I mean, they're the best, no doubt. And so after a while, I kind of got a little fed up, you know? And so Steve walks up there in my short, my t-shirt and I write down, you know, SF TF green. And I start putting a couple of notches on there and I go sit back down at my desk you know, and they all kind of stop. Like I said, there's probably 20 dudes there. Yeah. And uh, they're all looking like, what are you doing? I'm like, yeah, your guy uh, did this and he wasn't supposed to do that. He was supposed to do this. And they're like, oh, oh, look, lapping's getting ballsy, you know. And so it, it kind of became a, you know, a little competition <laughs> after that. But, but they respected it, you know, yeah, as long as I, for sure. as long as I, you know, was respectful. Plus, I didn't want to get my ass kicked by, you know, any of the 20 dudes in there. <laughs> no, no yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is not big army, right? I mean, this is no, your, your Delta I, yeah. and, a, and that. I'd have been taped to a chair pretty quick, I'm sure. <laughs> Can you talk us through um, op or objective reindeer, I think it is, um, context for that and what goes on in that particular event? So we had um, we had done two months and... We're out in um, Biop now. You know, we changed Psyop Airport, Saddam International to Baghdad. So that uh, he's no longer, you know, a figure. And we're living there. And we think, you know, mission complete again and all that good stuff. So Steve goes home and I'm home for maybe a week and a half. And I get a phone call and it's like, Steve, come back. We're going to start rotating. You know, we're not done yet. Wow. I'm like, oh, okay. So now I go back and um, uh, this is a, a rotation, you know, that goes on for the next, you know, eight, 10, 11 years. Uh, and, and one of the, the things that we did uh, initially was they call us up and they said, hey, we've got a terrorist training camp. Um, well, we're kind of waiting to see what's going to happen because the 101st has been given the mission to, to eliminate it. I'm like, OK, well, uh, why aren't they going to do it? Well, they've had it for two days. And they say they need two more days to plan for it. But the CG wants it done soon. When's he want it done? Tonight. Like, ah, I mean, it's just another mission. Yeah. So we get the, uh, the thumbs up and we move all of our uh, assets that we need for that night out to Al-Assad, which is out in the western part of Iraq. And we plan a mission with the Rangers. And it is a couple companies of uh, Rangers and four Blackhawks with uh, two AHs, two teams of AHs, so four AHs, excuse me, F-16s, AC-130s. And what's most memorable about that is train like you fight. So we had done scenarios like that with the Rangers, you know, First battalion, okay, great. You know, three months later, third battalion, four months later, second battalion. And, you know, it was so familiar to us because, you know, we just do it over and over again. And that's all this was initially was, you know, hey, we're planning a mission. And that's why we could do it within 24 hours. Um, we planned the mission and we executed just like we had done in the training scenario. So we could have been in Fort Benning you know, and, and executed it just like that. Um, obviously, you know, we had the, the the combat stake in it and there were some Rangers that were uh, wounded. Thank God no one was killed, but I think we were at 90 terrorists and all of them uh, did not fare well. And, you know, unfortunately we did have a couple of Ranger casualties on that, but the mission was, it's very timed and the time sequence is very precise. So the F-16s are going to hit it 
then the AC-130 is going to hit it, and then the AH-6s are going to hit it. Well, I was uh, I was the FMQ in the lead cockpit, meaning that the flight lead is responsible for everything, and the FMQ does you know whatever the flight lead tells them to do and make sure that he's set up. But the difference between the assault aircraft and the attack is that the flight lead is usually flying and the FMQ is navigating. So FMQ lapping has the map in front of them leading a eight ship assault force. Um, <laughs> it was four Blackhawks and two Chinooks and then two Little Birds. And, you know, <laughs> when this was our first real big mission, you know, that we were going after 98 dudes. And so we're going up there and, you know, now the flight lead turns and goes, are you sure this is right? This doesn't look right, you know, and you never need never need that little bit of, you know, hesitation. You know, I'm like, uh, stick with what you know, stick with what you know, you know, and I'm like, yep, just keep going this way. That's you what you're to saying that. to yourself. Steve? Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. I'm not going to let them talk me out of it. Um, and we get up there and, you know, the, the pre-assault fires are going from the AC-130. They're supposed to turn off. They're not because they're having a good time, you know, still shooting. We're yelling at them, stop, stop. So they finally turn off and we roll in um, with their two AHs, you know, and even after we had dropped some uh, 500 pound bombs and so the ACs engaged them for a couple minutes, there's still bad guys left. And so as we turn at our uh, ravine and, you know, again, we know exactly where we're going. We know exactly where they should be. And sure enough, you know, there they are. Well, they still got a little bit of fight into them. They're shooting at us. Really the first time I had seen tracers come at us, you know, I'd seen them go up in the air before out on the Vizobs, but uh, it was just, you know, that was kind of sad, you know, looking at, oh man, look at those guys. Now it's like, holy shit, you know, um, they're shooting at us. And so the, the Mike does a good job and we eliminate the threat there uh, for the most part. But at that same time, so what we're doing is pre-assault fires and then the Blackhawks land, you know, 30 seconds after us. And when the Rangers step off, you know, they had a couple of casualties wound, wounded and we stay on station for a couple hours. We do a, a target handoff with the other AH team. And it was just for the most part, uh, very successful. And so it, it was, you know, an, an attribute uh, or to all the planning that we'd done, you know, in training and it, it paid off. When you're coming in, I mean, I can just feel the pressure. If flight leads asking you, Hey, are you sure we're in the right spot here? Um, I can't even imagine. I mean, this hinges on you getting to the objective and, and there's no, I guess the year there's no GPS. This is you on a map. So by then we had GPSs, but this was, um, it wasn't, there weren't any reference marks, you know, so now we call them a piss, a point in space. And, you know, you just go out to a, a piss and you turn. Then the, you had to track the satellites because there wasn't good satellite coverage. So sometimes the GPS worked, sometimes it didn't. And so you couldn't count on it. And so, and you didn't. And, it, you know, it, the uh, the assault guys were behind us and they turned off at the RP, but I'm so now I'm having to get the AH, you know, on our uh, our engagement uh, heading, because, you know, if not, we're going to be shooting into the ground force and we want to make sure we're not doing that. So, it, it, yeah, that was probably up to that point when my, the most stressful time that I'd had, you know, with a with an engagement. When you transition from navigation into the attack profile there to go and take a shot, as the FMQ guy, are you the one who's going to end up doing the bump and the shot, or are you handing that off to flight lead? No, nope. yeah, that, that's all flight lead. So the flight lead is primarily responsible for rounds on target, you know, no errors. And he did just that, you know, he put it into there and uh, it, he did a couple more engagements and then he, he, if, if it's a good flight lead, he's going to turn it over because the FMQ who flies with a flight lead is a pretty experienced guy. You want an experienced cockpit up their lead, you know, getting you up there. 
And so he let me fly and, and I was able to do some engagements with some other guys in, uh, in reeds. So a couple of the guys, you know, uh, they, they probably weren't in good shape, but you know, they were crawling out and we, we still got calls for fires on them. And, uh, you know, so Mike gave me his crumbs to, you know, clean up. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a pretty big, um, ground force as well on a static target like that. How, um, was it difficult? I don't know if you recall. Was it difficult to kind of orient? Here's where our our fort, like the friendlies, are versus the enemy. Was it fairly easy to deconflict that in that scenario? I thought so because it, it you know it was planned out. We knew what everyone was going to be doing. There's, uh, I believe, three different HLZs, so we knew where they were going to be. They they're all marked, you know, with their IR lighting, and they've got their forward observers, you know, have their um, marking apparatuses, you know, and we're like, Hey, where's the flight? Who's the forward guy? Okay. There you are. And we're able to talk and just really control the movement of the ground force. And the fog of war wasn't there. Now yeah. I will tell you, you know, when you're doing jump through your ass without knowing really what the ground force is going to do, especially during the day, then it's, uh, much more, you know, uh, 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 uh I'd say more deliberate, you know, yeah. you're just not going to go in there and shoot because you, you aren't sure, you know, the effects. Um, and I think, did you not get a DFC in that one? Um, yes. For reindeer, yeah. uh, the, the both crews got uh, distinguished. Yeah, that's, pretty amazing. that's amazing. Congrats on that. Jeez. Um, the other one that I was hoping we could talk about was, and actually this is kind of like a, it's amazing how many opportunities here for the operations you had that we could choose from, but just looking through some of these, could we talk about, uh, Leadville? I think it is. Sure. So, uh, I guess we've been over about two years and everything is at night, you know, night stalkers, we own the nights, uh, ground force moving during the night, uh, men with green faces, you know, and, it's all oriented during the night. Well, come to find out that the bad guys have been moving around during the day kind of at will. And so the command didn't like that. And they wanted to come up with a means to be able to stop them. Well, you know, you already have a good portion of the force deployed. We've got troops in Afghanistan. We've got troops in Iraq. And then we've got, you know, the ready force that we always have. So, I mean, what are we going to do? How are we going to stand up another half Hilo assault force? Well, we can't. I mean, we're just, you know, we're stretched thin, but, you know, the, the task force CG says, let's make it happen. And so, of course, you know, the ground force comes up with something. And, it, you know, what they decided was, well, we're going to do a very small and light um, task force, and we're going to shock and awe and then get the hell out of there you know so we're going to do a hit surprise and then we'll leave and let the battle space owner come in and, and clean it up so basically what that meant was is that if there was a bad guy who was leaving a bad area going to another bad area that if we could catch him between those two areas then we had an opportunity you know to stop the vehicle and exploit that and not be in such a bad position with a small uh, shoot we had, I guess that the ground force comprised of about 20 guys. So when you're talking about 20 assaulters out in the middle of Iraq and we went all over that country, you know, so it's not like we did not pick where we went, you know, we were told uh, where we were going and some of the places were, were not, were not good. And so uh, this being one of those situations, um, we also had criteria if the mission called for it, that we could do a, uh, a house assault. Otherwise, you know, we only did uh, day VI, which is a vehicle interdiction. We're going to get this car between A and B. And if he gets too close to, you know, to B, then we let him go. He, you know, he, beat us that day. Well, if the HVT, the high value target, the enemy is deemed to be an acceptable risk for a uh, building assault, then, you know, that's what we're going to do. 
And so this particular mission, we got information that the uh, planner for the Madrid, Spain uh, train bombing was in country doing some recruiting. So we forward stage down to Baghdad and what we called it was the triple deuce hunt club. We had uh, two little birds with uh, two M86s, two A86s and two Blackhawks with about 20 guys. And that's all really that we could afford to spare for this mission. But it turned out to be real effective, you know, with that mission criteria. So we're down waiting, you know, and it's, uh, it's hot. It's, uh, it was May, May, 2006, um, Mother's Day. And we were still defining, you know, our TTP, tactics, techniques, and procedures. And we had done some, a bunch of VIs, but, you know, later on, we got real good at it. But this time, you know, we're, we're still working on some of, uh, some of our tactics. And we get a call that they had a, a, a voice intercept. They know where this guy's at. And we're usually not told where because, you know, they don't know. They kind of know an area. So they just tell us, take off, head south, 185. So we take off. We're heading south, 185. And all of a sudden, you know, then we started getting more intel. Hey, it's a blue, the proverbial blue bongo. <laughs> uh, blue bongo. He's, uh, you know, okay, turn. Yeah, probably go left, uh, 170. And then, you know, a couple minutes later, okay, here's the grid. Where he's at and so now we have a a objective to go to um, we can start kind of setting it up but he's at a location and so we're like okay are we waiting for him to leave and they're like nope this guy warrants a a building assault well before they left um you know we usually get a picture of the building so the black hawk guys can and the the little birds can formulate their landing plan and we weren't able to get that but i think that they got it in routes saw what it looked like and you know so <laughs> you know literally we're 10 minutes out you know formulating our plan you know that's kind of about shooting from the hip well as we get up closer you know we're told from the asset that's watching the target vehicle uh, yep he's there he's moving towards the vehicle it looks like he's going to leave after all and so we're told if he leaves, engage him. So the, the VI missions had um, either, you know, capture, um, shoot who's ever in there, like the driver or something, but keep the, the HVT alive or um, terminate everybody. You know, this is a kill mission. Well, this was definitely a kill mission because this was a bad guy. Everyone who was with him was a bad guy. So we're told, you know, this uh, kill mission. If he attempts to leave, you know, engage the vehicle. So now we're told as we get closer, they can hear us. And so we're being told that eh, they know you're there. They're starting to haul ass. Well, it's too late by then. So I'm trail, uh, wingman again for, for the lead aircraft. He bumps, uh, bends it over at the top and engages this bongo truck. And it just goes up like a match head. You know, they got explosives in there. It's, it's a, just a very high volume of, of ammunition and other crap bomb making materials in there. Um, as I bend over, you know, and what I'm referring to that is at the top of the, the bump, you know, now you're looking at things, you're assessing what you're going to do. And it was kind of obvious to me, like, well, no need to shoot there. He's, you know, target destroyed. So we come off cold. Uh, two does and and we go to holding now and we're like shoof man that's that's pretty bad well the ground force lands because they're going to go over and they're going to do their uh, their sensitive site exploitation sse they called it and you know find out why this guy's there because usually bad guys are with more bad guys well as they get there you know their shots fired from the ground so it's, it is, it's been confirmed. It's another bad guy location. So now we've got an assault force on the ground and receiving fire. And now we're trying to assess the situation to kind of go back a little bit. 
when we called the battle space owner, and this is in the Eusophia Triangle, we ask them, we always give them a heads up once we're there. Um, hey, we've got a, a small assault force that's going in your battle space. We need your QRF numbers and how soon you could be there. <laughs> and the, the, the response we got back was, uh, yeah, no. They're like, what do you mean? Yeah, we ain't going in there. You know, that is the worst wow. place in Iraq right now. One, they, they didn't have the capability to go in there. They just didn't have the numbers. You know, they were barely able to have some OPs that um, were on the periphery of this area. Oh, yeah. They had shot down two Apaches in this area within the last, uh, I think, 40 days. And, you know, so now we know that there's a air to, or a ground to air threat. So we knew going in there that we wanted to hit and get out. Well, while we're going in there, you know, they're, they're feeding us cast, close air support. So we've got uh, slowly, we've got some F-16s, F-15s coming over to us just in case. Well, we get on on the objective, we engage the vehicle, the ground force is on there, and now they start taking, you know, fire. Um, we decide we're going to go ahead and hit the building. And so the AHs move off to the west. We uh, drop a JDAM on the building, and I'm just looking at it, and you can just – not imagine anybody living through this airstrike and maybe you know it takes a minute for the smoke to clear and the dust and you're just looking at it like man 100 percent, good hit good hit right on and it, you know as i'm congratulating you know the, the team freaking door or rubble opens up and people start walking out and you're just like no way so now it's two, three, four, you know, seven or eight people walk out, uh, women included, you know. And so now the, the ground force wants to get over there and, you know, interrogate them. And at, as they move towards the building, start receiving more fire. And now it has turned into a, you know, a pretty good gunfight on the ground. And, you know, we're, we're in our holding. We're waiting for calls for fire. And sure enough. All right. Now the uh, the JTAC's calling us in and we're doing shooting very close and we're doing danger close, which is, you know, shoot. I think that the closest I shot, same with uh, lead was probably within, you know, 30 feet. Jesus. I mean, very close in, in canal. Now we didn't shoot rockets, you know, we shot many, but we had that relationship working with these guys. They knew, you know, that. Um, that we could shoot that close and not shoot them. Steve, what, and, sorry, just real quick, what altitude, like when you guys were bumping and coming over uh, for a shot that close, how, what was your distance from the target at that time? How, how high were you, you think? So we didn't get much above 50 to a hundred feet during the day. Get, Cause you know, we're trying to make out. sure that we don't get, yeah. <laughs> and so, so when we bumped, you know, we'd bump up to maybe, you know, two or 300 feet if we had to, to acquire the target. but we, we, you know, during the day, we did not want to get up and our normal altitude, you know, hundreds of feet during the night. Um, but yeah, this is, you know, you're flying right over the top of the trees. And so we had uh, a lot of engagements, you know, at, at close altitude, you know, shooting down, you know, to 50 meters before breaking off. And uh, it just, it went until we were Winchester, meaning that we didn't have any more ammunition. And we had to go back to the FARP um, and rearm, refuel, and come back. And I think we had done that twice. And during that time, again, this is a bad area, you know. So as we are there longer, the locals are starting to um, close in on the objective area. And so as, as I remember coming back, from the FARP and flying over people and they're moving towards the direction of the objective. I'm like, all right, this is bad. People don't move towards the objective area. So we talked a little bit about it in the cockpit and we said, okay, anyone who's moving towards objective is enemy, you know, but let's just kind of wait. Let's not, you know, engage anybody just yet. And uh, 
about that time, we took some uh, rounds to the rotor blade, I'm like son of a bitch. I just flown over this guy who had gotten out of a pickup truck and I knew it was him. So it kind of pissed me off that, you know, I let him go, you know, because I wasn't sure if he was a combatant or not. And, you know, it turned out that, yeah, he was. Um, the other aircraft is, has taken some damage. They got shot, uh, their gun cable, the radio. So things are just kind of going bad for us. You know, it's, it's turning into a pretty good fight and we're, uh, just shoot, you know, for it, it's an hour now, you know, that we're fighting and that's about 55 more minutes than we wanted to be there. But we can't leave because um, they they wanted it to be on the objective and make sure you know that they were getting all the intel that they could, and it, it was a pretty it was worth it. Yeah. But, but they're dropping bombs, you know. They've got the cat the stack, and so when you talk about a cast stack, it's you know you've got an air, aircraft at eight thousand, you've got two more at eighty five hundred, and they're just stacked all the way up for ten thousand feet. And they're just dropping bombs, and you know. It's um, it's a very busy day for the JTAC, and after a while, we've kind of become combat ineffective. You know, I, I've got uh, well, d d excuse me, one story. So after our blade is is shot, you know, the aircraft's not acting good. So I know where the the talk is. You know, where the commander is, and uh, and the radio, the JTAC. So we land the aircraft by them and we do an emergency shutdown, you know, no cool down or anything, reach into the back. And we each of us have what's called a go bag or a three day bag. And then, it, you know, we've got ammo, food, you know, maybe some licky chewies and stuff like that. Um, we land, we each grab our three day bag and, you know, we're hauling ass to where the ground force is, you know, we get there and kind of jump in, you know, and, and uh, it was the troop commander. He's just kind of looking at me and I kind of look at him like, man, you must have thought we looked like idiots running over here with this, all this pilot shit on, huh? He goes, yeah, you guys did look a little ridiculous. <laughs> but all the ground guys start coming to us now and they're like, hey, what's in the, what's in the go bag? You know, and I'm like, ah, you know, they're like, you got ammo? And I'm like, yeah, I got ammo. So, you know, they open up my bag and they're going through and I'm like, oh, awesome. You know, here I am surrounded in the middle of enemy territory and I've got the world's best special forces soldiers going to, you know, surround and keep me safe. Well, they grab all my magazines and hand grenades and then they haul ass. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they've got a job to do. I, I just, you know, it's just kind of it was funny at the time. I, I knew what they were going to do. So now it's just uh, two SF guys and two pilots out there, you know, forming our little perimeter in this little depression. And uh, we did that. And one of the Blackhawks went and got another blade and they bring it back. So they get another little bird blade at the, at our ARP site, um, bring it back. And as they're inbound, you know, we get our shit and we run back out to the aircraft, take the old, the uh, bad blade off the crew chief and uh, one of the ground guys are running over the new blade. We put the blade wow. back on there. You know, people are shooting at us and, you know, we're, we're pretty good at, at putting the blade on there. We've got it on, you know, within 30 seconds or so we, and meanwhile, um, the other aircraft had landed at our aircraft and we had went out there and taken all of our ammunition out of our aircraft and gave it to him so he could continue fighting, you know, while, while we're down. So, so, now, so this is just one aircraft that's down. The, yes. Oh, I didn't. Okay. Got yeah, it. So, so the other aircraft has taken rounds, but they're still flyable. Okay. But uh, because our blade, you know, it, it was uh, at the trailing edge. And for, you know, those who aren't familiar with uh, a, a moving rotor blade, it doesn't do real well when it's uh, when the aerodynamics are, are changed in it. So we got a new blade on there. It's not tracked or anything, but it'll fly. And so we get up. Um, we've got some, some ammo with us and we go back into engagements. You know, we're there for probably another 15 minutes, uh, engaging targets. And it was, it became usually the AHs are controlled by the ground force, right? You tell us what you want us to shoot, but it became 
just so many targets that we were just shooting on our own, you know, and I couldn't talk with lead because his radios were out, but I saw what needed to be done. And so we, we picked our own targets and we engaged them. Um, Red, who's flying next to me, you know, is pointing stuff out when we're running low. And I, I was never big on the concept of, you know, throwing grenades or shooting the M4 out. But I mean, this was an instance where we were low on ammo. We didn't have a lot. So Don shooting his, you know, M4 out and with me yelling at him, don't shoot us down. You know, just, the easiest thing to do is go into a tight bank and he's shooting out, you know, now he's shooting through the rotor blades themselves. So we did that. Now we, we don't have any M4 ammo left or anything. And uh, the other aircraft, you can tell they're coming over trying to get our attention that they're having some, some flight control issues now. So we take off. Um, but oh, sorry, we know we need to take off. And before this, we had said, Hey, we need some help out here. You know, we're, we're combat ineffective now. And at the MSS, the mission support site, which is probably maybe 20, 25 minutes away, we've got the night crew and the night crew is, you know, sleeping because it's the middle of the day, but we uh, asked them to, to come and relieve us. So they're given a phone call up there. They wake them up. The guys, you know, no questions asked, jumping in their chariots of death. Another AH team comes out. And as we're leaving, um, I do a battle handoff because lead can't talk. His radios are all uh, shot out. And tell them, say, hey, you know, here's the situation. We've been holding to the West things ain't going good over this way. You know, you guys may want to try the East and they give us a, okay. You know, not a lot of hesitation, not a lot of questions Their Their primary intent is to get over and talk to the JTAC who's going to control them and give them the ground situation so they can go to work. Well, we head off to BIOP and do a, uh, a run on landing with a skid aircraft over in the little taxi area, get out. The, everything's okay. He's flyable, but, you know, definitely have some combat damage. So we determined that we can make it back to the MSS. We'll get back there, let maintenance take a look at it, reload, and then we'll go back and relieve the other guys. Well, we get back to the MSS, and as maintenance is coming out, uh, you know, we're going to go in and, you know, maybe get a bottle of water or something while they're fixing everything. They came and told us that uh, uh, sorry, the other team was engaged and Trail was shot down, both killed. And so, you know, they had just got there. And what had happened was we found out later is that that uh, anti-aircraft unit that had shot down the Apaches was, you know, right over in that area. And so they didn't really have much of a chance. You know, they went into, uh, you know, an engagement and uh, uh, they had to climb up to get above the, the power lines which put them in, you know, uh, oh. just uh, right where the other guys needed them. And so they engaged Chalk 2, just uh, shot down, crashed and burned. And Lead was shot up enough where he couldn't fly. And <clears throat> so, you know, they got our aircraft ready. We're getting ready to walk out and crank and go back out. And uh, that's when we got word that uh, we're not allowed to go back. And I have to assume, Steve, like you probably knew these guys so well. Same unit, right? I mean, it's, I mean, these are just, it's just the night crew from your company. Yeah. So CW5, Jamie Weeks and Major Matt Worrell. Worrell, who was uh, just, you know, senior crews, you know, and, and the lead aircraft had, had senior members and, and it's, and, uh, you know, I won't mention the names, but obviously with Jamie and Bubba, um, 
if, if there was one gun pilot, you know, and, you know, no shit who taught me, you know, most of, of what I knew as a gun pilot was Jamie, you know, he was just a uh, down to earth Alabama boy, Cobra Apache pilot. And uh, <laughs> just, you know, the best sense of humor. And uh, those were our first KIAs uh, in country. And, you know, to not be able to go back out there and help, or at least, you know, oh, God. to go back on station when they came, you know, to relieve us, you know, and, and the feeling that I had when I did that battle handover with them, you know, it's like, oh, man, thank God these guys are here. You know, they they saved us, you know. And then the guilt, you know, is after they were shot down and, you know, we're safe, you know, back at the MSS and we can't go back. You know, it, it just got too hot. And so they didn't do any more. No one else could go to the objective until it got night. And so, you know, a couple of hours went by. I mean, they're just continuously dropping bombs. The night uh, crew scrubbed all their missions, you know, obviously. The, the primary mission now is to go back and recover the remains and, and get the ground force out of there. And so they do that. They go out there with just full force. And, and the, the bad guys knew, you know, not to yeah. fuck with them because uh, it would not have turned out well. So they recover the remains, uh, exfil the ground force. and you know, brought back the fallen angels, which is what the uh, down personnel are called. So it, it was a very tough day, you know, Mother's Day. Both of them married oh. kids. I have to imagine after that amount of time you've spent in service by then, that especially in aviation, like you've seen fatalities, but this must have been on sure. another level. Yeah. Uh, it, it was, you know, being personally involved right there, you know, and, and us being the ones that called for them, you know, I guess being like a commander, you know, hey, charge that machine gun, you know, that, that is something that needed to be done. It was, you know, it was all of our jobs, but, yeah, you know, just it, it, there was a sense of guilt for that. Definitely. I, um, Were you able to to get back in the cockpit again relatively easily the next few days, whenever it was you had to get back up or does that weigh on you or did you just have to push it out? You know, I, I think again, I was able to, to remove myself from that, you know, yeah. very sad. Um, the other crews uh, went back to escort the bodies back to the U S I stayed and we didn't do missions the next night, you know, we had a little ceremony. And then the day after that, you know, we went to work, you know, on. and it's just, yeah, it, it's, it didn't stop. Jeez. Um, one of the things that I, I wrote down as you were talking, just because of all the, the hell you've seen, and it may have been that night, but, or that day, sorry. But is, is there a particular discussion or call you had in the cockpit that you particularly remember, like, this is one of the hardest I ever had to make or one of the toughest discussions we ever had to have when you were up there? For that particular objective? Just any. It, it may. I guess what I'm saying is maybe it was on that objective, but as you think about the other times you've been flying, is there a, uh, is there a particular call or conversation you had that you you think back on like, that was, that was deep. Um, so they all seem to fall under the day missions, you yeah. know, cause day just anything could happen. Yeah. But, you know, I, I don't regret most of what I did. You know, I, I was, as everyone was professionals, you know, that's what we did. We were over there to, to hurt bad people, stop them from doing what they were doing. And, never had any malicious intent, you know, it was our job. However, you know, shit happens. And a couple things that, that I remember is um, when I was talking about, you know, the, the infancy stage of the day VI, well, 
uh, a white bongo looks like a white bongo looks like a white bongo. And before we had the ability to see what the the ISR asset was looking at, you know, before we had our own screens, we kind of talked through it. And if you've ever talked to anybody, you know, to going somewhere during the day, it's extremely difficult. So you with a four, three to four second delay. So sure. now we're flying and, you know, our job is to go up and engage this uh, white bongo to stop them. And, you know, okay, the, the vehicle. So this is, this is the, the feed we would be getting from the, the asset that's watching the vehicle. All right. He's uh, on highway one traveling in a high rate of speed, passing a, a Oh, it looks like a blue building. Oh, there's two cows. Okay. And then, you know, we'd see it. And then, you know, the intent was for us to identify the right vehicle and then, you know, do our engagement. Well, we came up on one and, you know, there it is. And um, one of the aircraft who was assigned to stop the vehicle um, attempted to stop the vehicle. And as we're engaging the vehicle, we're, we're hearing the ISR talk to us. Okay. He just passed a, you know, a corral on the right-hand side, you know, and everyone, you know, who's in the half is thinking, oh shit. You know, we just engaged the wrong vehicle. That's not this one. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, as we um, left, you know, because you slow down, we're like, okay, let's get back on it. So we continued and, and we found the right vehicle, engaged it and completed the mission. <sighs> so, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, we get done doing the, you know, the, the SSE there. We get everyone back on board and we fly south and we pass that vehicle and be in the wrong vehicle. You know, it's a father holding his son, you know, that we killed inadvertently. But, you know, it's just so that that's probably one of the things, you know, that, that I remember the most of something that I wish we could have taken back. Have back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and he's just looking at us and we just fly back, you know, you know, we wave to him like, you know, hey, sorry, you know, and, and we went back, you know, and he was compensated, you know, as much as you can compensate somebody for that. But yeah. so that was probably one of the shittiest times. I can imagine. Jesus. Um. Ah, so this went by way faster than I thought it would. Steve, I'm sorry for taking so much of your time. Um, no, not I mean, at all. I, I, know I don't you, even know where are we at. A couple hours now. <laughs> so, sorry. Uh, no, no, no. This has been great. Um, I I know since you've been out, like you still have to. You're still involved with supporting the warfighter. You're still involved with veterans. Um, how do you think back on some of these moments? Like, um, do, do you, do these anniversaries come back to you as you think about like when, when Jamie Weeks passed away, um, some of these more dangerous moments, do they kind of reflect year on year? You know, that's one of the things that, that the community and whole and the unit does, you know, I just came back from the 40th anniversary, uh, at Fort Campbell. And the largest turnout that we've ever had. And I try to go back to those, you know, at least the 10 year anniversary, but the, the unit does it right. I mean, there's no doubt, you know, that the gold star uh, family member program that they yeah. have to take care of everyone. Um, I, I always feel I never do enough, you know, and no one does. How can you, you know, ever yeah. do enough for, for someone who's lost, but um, they're never forgotten. You know, we had a uh, couple training deaths. You know, we were doing overwater training and we lost a soldier to drowning. Um, and, you know, that was probably one of the hardest things. You know, he's underneath my aircraft and um, is had an equipment failure. And it, not that I remember him more so than anyone else, but there was some family you know, tragedy there also involved. And, and so every, every day, any, uh, an event happened, you know, it, I remember it, but I also don't, I don't think I've ever had any personal issues, you know, with, with PTSD or anything like that. 
I've been able to, you know, compartmentalize that. And, you know, I, so I feel very fortunate because I know how tough it is, you know, on others. And, uh, and I do have times, you know, when I reflect and I kind of need to be by myself, but for the most part, I think I'm able to lead a, a normal life. Yeah. So there, there's two questions I like to ask everybody before uh, before we break, and one of them is: as you were flying, was there anything? And this is specifically in combat, but probably the same loadout that I would imagine you'd have. But is there anything that you always wanted to have with you, like a good luck charm, something that somebody gave you that had sentimental value, a picture, an item like that? <sighs> I I can't think of anything. So I was never um superstitious if you will you know I, a lot of people had things on there i always wanted to have you know more gas and more bullets i guess <laughs> i like it i like it it sounds like you had a good go bag though as well <laughs> yeah i i got a lot of shit from my my you know co-workers that uh because i spent a lot of time building that bag i mean i had a little hatchet in it and all other kinds of things and, you know, I used to kid them and said, hey, if we go, you know, if we have to land, which I had done at least three or four times, and you try to come over and get shit out of my bag, uh, it ain't going to work out well for you. <laughs> oh, and, you share with me. Yeah. Uh, high demand, obviously, when it exactly. came in, in need. Um, and then just the last question I ask everybody, uh, I, you talked about a lot of so somber moments, um, some sacrifice on a great scale and a very long, long period of service. Um, as you look back on that, Steve, and you think about it, would you go back and do that again? Hundred percent. I said I don't regret anything. Um, obviously, you know, staying in thirty-one and a half years, uh, they kicked me out. You know, I was at the end my my legal contract, but it the army was so good to me. It was good to my family. You know, all three of my kids were born in Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Um, I don't know if my wife would answer the same, you know, and, and I haven't mentioned her here, but, yeah. you know, gone, uh, I was in the 160th for 21 years, probably averaged, you know, 200 to 230 days gone out of the year. So you can imagine who raised our kids and just the incredible, you know, work that, that, that she did, um, <laughs> Again, I don't know what her answer would be for that, but I think it would be, you know, because of the support that we had through the unit and friends, I, I think she'd say the same thing. But uh, so much respect to all the wives and family members for supporting, you know, those that, that deployed. Yeah, agree entirely. I can't imagine the uh, the amount of work that went into that. With uh, And I think when you mentioned those 200 plus days, that's probably pre and post 9-11, just even the training op tempo yes. is so high there. So it doesn't matter if it's combat. I mean, combat only makes it more dangerous, but the time away is, it's always there for y'all. Um, Steve, I don't know if you have a book in you one day, but I think you got enough stories. We didn't even touch on Jessica Lynch, Saddam Hussein. There's a lot more there. So thank you so much for the time um, sharing this with us. It's been really interesting. And thanks for being so real about everything. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. Uh, I enjoyed talking with you. Sorry I went on so long. No, not at all. No, that, I'm glad. <laughs> I just realized how long it had been. So thank you very much. Appreciate it, Steve. I hope you enjoyed this combat story. Uh, you all know that I love hearing from another pilot, especially someone in 160th. Their skills are just on another level. So let's jump into some listener comments. We've got a uh, first one here. It's a YouTube comment on Billy Billingham. It's from Wayne Pratt. He says, I love this podcast and it's great to see British soldiers on the show watching from the UK. Would like to see Christian Craighead and Nims Perja tell their stories. Billy is a true inspiration in the UK to anyone wanting to join the military. Yeah, and definitely not just the UK. Had a lot of really positive feedback from many Americans who just love hearing that story. And obviously, we're so close, the Brits and the, and the Yanks, as they like to say. Um, so it feels like one of our own as well. But this, this particular comment was interesting because uh, the reference to Christian Craighead and Nims Perja, I've reached out to both of them. If anyone out there has a way to get me in contact and get them on the show, please do. I would love to get them on. Big fans of both of them. If you don't know them, just take a quick look um, online. You'll see some 
incredible stories of bravery, sacrifice, and, um, and pushing the limits in a way that many of us never see. The next comment is a YouTube comment on the Lisa Jaster interview, and it's from Ted Archibald. He says, I love your story. Thank you for sharing the engineer's perspective. My father-in-law was in the Royal Engineers serving with the Canadian military in World War II, and your experiences echo some of his in scrounging resources and material. That's so true. And I position that that interview as a lot about Lisa's experience with um, getting through ranger school, um, setting, you know, like breaking some barriers. But I also, and I think what got overlooked is her time as a combat engineer, just as an engineer in general, and what they do on the battlefield and how they enable operations and how they're rolling around outside the wire with no protection besides themselves. They don't have any um, SF team that's helping them get through or, or get down uh, different main routes. They have to go and literally figure out where they're going to get material, get it to where it needs to be. They are the ones who make this possible for us to be forward deployed to where we were. So it's an interesting story if you're ever curious about, hey, how did that fob even get there? Um, how did it get the resourcing it needed? Like It's people like Lisa. So thank you for leaving these comments. Really appreciate it. Thanks for the support, everyone. Hope you all have a great rest of your day or week. Stay safe.